Hola, soy Giancarlo Vaque y tengo un problema con la representación de los hispanos y latinos en los videojuegos. Normalmente hablo inglés en mis videos, pero quería comenzar este en español para ayudar a explicar mi punto. Quiero que pienses en cómo te sientes en este momento. Espero que esto esté creando una pequeña cantidad de incomodidad. Nada grande, pero al menos una sensación de algo familiar, pero extraño. Esto es lo que siento cuando interactúo con la representación latino-hispano en los videojuegos, en el mejor de los casos. The fact is, Hispanic and Latino representation in video games is kinda not great. Our heritage is often swept under the rug or hyper-exaggerated for out-of-worldliness. We're portrayed as stereotypes and used for the purposes of comedic relief in many stories. Other times, our cultures are mashed together and washed out into a single color. And I'm not just talking about thinking Hispanic and Latino is the same thing, which, by the way, it's not. And recently, and probably most frustrating, our struggles are co-opted to make people feel sad. I'd like to break down these faux pas, explain why they're not acceptable forms of representation, or at least not where they need to be, and maybe teach you a little bit about the incredibly vast and colorful differences between Central, South, and Caribbean American cultures. A majority of Hispanic and or Latino characters exist as tokens to point at when inclusivity comes into question. Typically, a vaguely Spanish last name is all many of these possess, and they're quickly overshadowed by other characters. Mass Effect 3's James Vega comes into the series too little too late to make any lasting impact as a key squad member and sits on the Normandy as an afterthought for many players who've already fallen in love with series favorites like Garrus or Tally. All Sid Margrace, named after real life historical figure El Cid and sporting the most inconsistent accent in Final Fantasy XII, seems like he'll be an important character given his introduction but quite literally walks out of the story after serving little to no purpose or function. Function. Neither James or Alcid ever have a chance to stand out as impactful characters. James quickly exposes himself as a generic do-gooder military man, and Alcid largely functions as the noble from far away, here to do important things before going back home. These are two I pulled out of a hat, but perfect examples of how characters like these are neat at first, but overall vacant of any significant representation for Hispanic Latino players. More prolific Hispanic or Latino characters have their identities brushed to the wayside or are relegated to being the sidekicks to non-marginalized characters, even when their personal growth and conflicts are just better than the protagonists they're standing behind. Across three games, we watch Gears of War's Dominic Santiago descend into depression, madness, and trauma. From driving himself mad to find his wife, to losing everything he holds dear to the Locust, and eventually sacrificing himself after spiraling into a dark corner of his own mind. Dominic Santiago has the motive, the inner and external conflicts and sympathetic struggles of a great Latino protagonist. And yet, he takes a backseat to Marcus Phoenix, an infinitely less interesting character with little to drive the main plot forward in terms of his own goals or feelings, of which he has few. Despite being the far stronger character, Dom plays second fiddle to a white man with a funny name. Sebastian Castellanos, the main character of The Evil Within 1 and 2, has little to no nods to his own heritage within the narrative or environmental storytelling. While this doesn't seem like a problem, because ultimately representation is more than name dropping the country a character is from, The Evil Within's narrative structure practically relies on building upon Castellanos' life. The mind warping, deep dive nature of The Evil Within's world and Sebastian's goal of rescuing his daughter opens the floor to discuss his personal life and tell the story of their relationship in some way through their shared culture. Its absence in either of these games can mean two things, neither of which are positives towards representation. Either Hispanic and Latino culture doesn't sell well according to market analysts, and or these two characters aren't fundamentally Latino or Hispanic in the first place. Their names are just Spanish to add a little color to the narrative scenery. 
Understandably, I'm not proposing Sebastian and his daughter share a memory where they shoehorn dialogue about her abuelo's picadillo recipe, but maybe some objects in the background or hell, have Dom's final words to his wife be in Spanish, maybe? Little touches like the ones I'm suggesting do more than satisfy the desire for more representation in games. They're great ways to build a memorable character, details with opportunities to create an interesting cutscene or background aesthetic with. It's the same effect a game like Yakuza has when someone on screen is cooking a popular Japanese dish, or how the PS4 Spider-Man game made sure to include a ton of hot dog stands in its rendition of New York. These thoughtful additions can improve our suspense of disbelief and, despite not necessarily having a frame of reference, still help us attach to the characters interacting with them. Thoughtful is the key word here, because there are plenty of thoughtless ideas on how to represent Hispanics and Latinos in games, and most of them fall under a specific word. Stereotypes. More accurately, racism, but I'm trying to be a nice guy and give people the benefit of the doubt, so in order not to scare anyone away, we'll say stereotypes. Unfortunately, this is where most Latino and or Hispanic characters in video games fall under, and you may not have realized or thought about why for many of them. Let's play a game. I want you to think of any Hispanic or Latino video game character I haven't mentioned yet. I'm going to describe a few stereotypes for you with some examples, but if at any point the character you're thinking of has the stereotype, go ahead and pick another character. See how many you can think of. The easiest and by far most offensive portrayal of Hispanic and Latino characters is often as criminals or villains. Gang members, drug dealers, scientists for the Umbrella Corporation, and sometimes literally just people who live in a rural town, I guess. This is usually accompanied by low effort Spanglish inserted into dialogue to really get across the people using those words aren't safe to be around. Spanglish is a common dialect used by Latinos here in the United States, but usually consists of well-known Spanish sayings or entire strings of Spanish prefacing, succeeding, or sandwiched in the middle of an English paragraph. Not exclusively Spanish curse words substituted in whenever it would apply. Besides the use of Spanish as a silly set of swear words, it also isn't great when most of your Hispanic and or Latino characters are villains. It says we can't be the heroes in a story, innocent bystanders, or at the very least, a neutral party. A dearth of good guy Hispanic Latino characters reinforces the idea that anyone resembling or speaking the way we do isn't to be trusted. If they aren't criminals, then they're probably drunks or drug addicts. Alternatively, sexual deviants who don't respect personal spaces. For some reason, Latino characters need to be introduced with a bottle in their hand or an inability to control themselves, a trait some games will use to code characters as Latino without having to outright say it. A good example of this and vivid personal memory of mine is in Borderlands 2, a great first-person shooter RPG I happen to be very fond of. In Borderlands 1, my go-to character was Mordecai, the sniper class of the four you could choose from. I loved sniping enemies from afar, but Mordecai's pet bird, Bloodwing, added a fun dynamic to playing as a sniper. And Borderlands 2 promised to flesh out the original cast as NPCs. Lilith was a snarky but clumsy leader reminding me of Spider-Man. Roland was a stalwart hero without a sliver of fear. Brick had embraced his violent nature and became king of the psychos. And Mordecai was a drunk with a Mexican accent. Now, to my knowledge, there's no Mexico in the Borderlands universe, but even in Borderlands 1, Mordecai's mask and general appearance is commented on as resembling a Truxican wrestler. It gets worse when you realize Truxican may just be a portmanteau of truck and Mexican. The kicker is the playable character in Borderlands 2, Salvador, is characterized as a savage brute and has the highest bounty out of all the Vault Hunters for a number of crimes including cannibalism and mass murder. He's also described as short and stocky, a result of heavy steroid use, of course. Neither of these characters can explicitly be Hispanic or Latino but the intent is for players to make that connection themselves, to play on the already existing association between those attributes and those ethnicities. The wrestling comment is probably the biggest giveaway Mordecai is supposed to be a Mexican caricature, as dressing up your Mexican characters as luchadores is the next most common stereotype. 
You'll usually find this in fighting games where basing characters on exaggerated stereotypes is almost tradition. Lucha Libre is absolutely an important part of Mexican culture, but it's not the only fighting discipline a character from Latin America can possess. And to be clear, neither is Capoeira. Especially when some of the greatest boxers in history were Mexican is the hard pivot to making every Mexican fighter in a fighting game a luchador incredibly ignorant of the untapped potential these characters have. Characters like El Fuerte and Amingo, the sombrero-wearing, guitar-playing cactus who can only say one comprehensible word, are dumbed-down representations of a much deeper culture than El Fuerte's combo list full of culinary dishes implies. Some would argue El Fuerte's backstory and combos named after Mexican dishes are a nod or celebration of Mexican culture. I'd like to touch on that subject, but first, let me give you a few more stereotypes to check off your lists. Dressing Hispanic characters like matadors or having them put roses in their mouths and bow like one, giving them stereotypical accents and having those characters voiced by white, non-Hispanic or Latino actors, and characterizing them as quick to anger, violent people are all certifiably horrible forms of representation and in most cases problematic. Short reasons as to why. Bullfighting is a cruel and archaic sport, and a lot of Spaniards have spoken out against it. Even though I'm both Hispanic and Latino, I don't have an accent, and labeling an entire set of ethnicities as violent is just high-key racist. Try to think of a Hispanic and or Latino character that doesn't have any of the problems I've mentioned, and let me know if you find one. Now, let's have an awkward conversation about when celebrating a culture becomes parody depending on who's focusing on what. When suddenly, something inspired by tradition and history becomes eye candy for consumers with no real attachment to either. I'm talking about guacamole. Guacamole is considered a metroidvania and is based on Mexican culture and mythos. Augusto Quijano, the concept lead at Drinkbox Studios in Canada, created Guacamole because he was tired of the misrepresentation of Mexico and Mexican culture, and wanted to capture the love and nostalgia he had for his country. And the game is beautiful to look at. Bright, wonderful colors and still a sense of passion and energy, characters you encounter are based off of real Mexican folklore, the environments modeled after Aztecian architecture and Mexican pueblos. These elements of guacamole are wonderfully implemented and offer a true vision of what makes Mexican culture so important to Mexican people. In context, the lucha libre aspects of the game's combat system isn't taking advantage of a stereotype, but adding to a rich showcase. The game's also pretty damn good. But among Guacamele's fantastic forms of representation are some head-scratching choices which undermine the game's efforts. Video game references plastered all over Guacamele's central town and super outdated memes from the time take attention away from what makes it so special, and the two main characters are named Juan Aguacate and Tostada. For extra damage to what is otherwise a celebration, Juan breaks open barrels of alcohol to collect money, and bottles of tequila are scattered everywhere in almost every part of the environment. Of course, the game's naming scheme is tongue-in-cheek, and video game references were common in many indie games at the time of Guacamele's creation, but missteps like these weaken the representation we're seeking. Those funny posters, silly names, and trollolos distract players from respecting or appreciating the culture they're being shown. The references themselves are only funny because they're in Spanish, and the surface level humor and exaggeration of stereotypical elements sets the tone for players to laugh at anything vaguely referencing something Hispanic or Latino. It doesn't need them for comedy either. Guacamele is at its funniest when Y Chavo is sassing Juan about his abilities, or when finding out how Calaca outsmarted the devil. Even the game's name is a contentious issue, stuck between being a clever pun with an appealing sound and another distraction from what makes the game special. The mixed signals result in players laughing at Mexican culture, not with it. I can't blame Augusto Quijano though, no matter how Guacamele falters in doing so, it is still almost completely a love letter to his own culture and a fantastic piece of representation. He had little to no frame of reference for how to go about doing something like this because there aren't a lot of examples to build off of. Hell, I don't even know if those decisions were his to make. The fault lies in an industry which doesn't offer more opportunities for Hispanics or Latinos to be represented. And this is when things like guacamole mean a lot less. There's something I've been dancing around saying until I talked about stereotypes and Mexican stereotypes, because I need to point something out to the games industry that I don't think it knows. It's an ignorant and incredibly racist assumption the industry implicitly makes whenever it designs a Latino character. 
not all Latinos are Mexican. Remember the game we were playing? Here's a new challenge. Think of a single Hispanic or Latino character in a video game who isn't or isn't coded to be Mexican or a Spaniard. I guarantee you'll be able to count the amount of characters who fit the criteria on one hand. Two, if you're thinking of Brazilian fighting game characters. And if you have to Google for it, I think I've established my point pretty well. There's a reason I've been saying Hispanic and or Latino in this video so far. It's because Hispanic and Latino don't necessarily mean the same thing, and both are somewhat reductive terms our communities have adopted in North America in order to reinforce our visibility. This retention of being seen comes at a price. Our cultures have become drained of their individualities in the eyes of many non-Hispanic and non-Latino people. Here's a brief description of the terms Hispanic, Latino, Latina, Latinx, and Latine. And yes, I'm probably going to get some of this wrong. So the United States is a big country with lots of different races, ethnicities, and cultures existing within it. In its earliest conception, Hispanic referred to Los Hispanos de Nueva Mexico, or Los Nueva Mexicanos, Americans descended from the Spanish-speaking settlers who colonized what is now known as New Mexico, Utah, Colorado, Texas, and Arizona. After some time, the term was used to refer to anyone of Spanish-speaking descent or nationality. The problem is, it's incredibly exclusive. Hispanic doesn't represent everyone from Latin America. Latin America is one of the largest continental regions. It spans from Mexico through Central American countries like Nicaragua and Guatemala, all of South America and parts of the Caribbean like Cuba, the island of Haiti and El Republico Dominicano, and Puerto Rico. It's not just Spanish, it's Portuguese, it's French, it's Creole. The term American Latin was actually coined in France to refer to any person in the Americas with descent from the Romantic languages, but is speculated to have been used as a way to justify European involvement in Latin American colonialism at the time. This is where the term Latino comes from, and Latin American scholars disagree heavily with its usage because of the way it ties into colonialism. Basically, not every Latin American country experienced the same kind of colonization. Many countries in Latin America have entire histories of rebuking colonialism and have traditions and heritages that actively push back against European culture. As such, the term Latin America in and of itself can be considered offensive in the region it's describing because it plays on the idea that those countries owe their identities to their European colonizers. Nevertheless, in the United States, Latino is still used by many descended or directly from the region to describe their identity. Certain romantic languages, like Spanish, are gendered. O's are used to denote masculinity, and A's denote femininity, with plurals generally adopting the masculine lettering, hence Latinos. Latinx is a recent addition in an attempt to introduce gender neutrality to the term, especially given its adoption by the English language, which isn't a gendered language. But Latinx is a bit hard to pronounce and not very friendly with romantic grammar, so Latine has become a popular alternative since it plays well with both types of languages. For the record, I like Latine more than Latino. Any update to our languages for more inclusivity is a welcome change. The reason I use Latino in this video is because Latine is still a relatively new word, and I didn't want to confuse what I'm assuming is a primarily English-speaking audience learning new things. From this point on, I'll be using Latine. But guess what? Given the chance to avoid those terms, multiple studies have shown the majority of Hispanics and Latines preferred to be referred to by their countries or families' countries of origin. We don't call each other Latine and Hispanic. We call each other Cuban, Colombian, Peruvian, Argentinian, Brazilian, Uruguayan, the list goes on. These are not the same cultures. There's a part of us which resonates with seeing the other represented because we do share many things in common, but the essence of who we are is not the same. Though both influenced by indigenous and African backgrounds, island cuisine is drastically different from South American dishes, and both branch off into distinct, unique developments depending on which country you're talking about. Latine dances are almost all influenced by African musical styles, but the merengue and the bachata are iconically Afro-Dominican, and the rumba and danzón were popularized by Afro-Cubans. 
even the words we use aren't the same. If I ask a Spanish speaker from the west coast of the United States if they can spot me money for the bus because I lost my kite while putting on some chest rub and need to go after it in Spanish, they might not understand me right away if I use the words Cubans use to describe those things, besides the sentence itself making me sound crazy. Terms like Hispanic and Latine are therefore reductive because it identifies us based on a vague idea of what a Spanish-speaking person is. We only use these terms in the United States because without them, we would have even less visibility than we do now. We unify under the same term in order to have a semblance of a voice. So you see, many of us can't identify with and aren't represented by Mexican characters because many of us aren't Mexican, and the differences between Mexicans and any South, Central, or Caribbean peoples are massive. If it sounds like a huge task to represent this many cultures, I'd ask you to look at the way the industry represents English cultures in video games. We take time to establish the difference between Canadians, Americans, and the English, to the point where it's borderline compensating for something. People who barely know anything about America are still aware of regional differences in America because of how much effort goes into representing each region and how often they get represented. Without ever having been to either place, I know the difference between a Texan and a Californian because of the way their distinct cultures are represented. Yet, despite Americans not all being Caucasians, the games industry is suddenly camera shy about highlighting those particular differences. In some cases, it even retcons what little representation Hispanics and Latines have. Rico Rodriguez used to be a fun representative for Hispanics and Latines, a Latine dictator fighting, oppressive government toppling, one man army. Until they Euro washed him in Just Cause 3 and made him insist that even though he was born in Mexico, the Mediterranean country of Medici was his real home and culture. Yes, that is indeed a real thing that happened. He's a great example of why Latina representation doesn't include European countries or work with blanket representation. If they were similar, there wouldn't have been a need to suddenly code Rico as Italian. He could have kept being Mexican, and Just Cause 3 could have taken place in some fictional Mexican-inspired city-state. But because they wanted a Mediterranean location with Mediterranean culture and traditions, Rico Rodriguez had his Mexican heritage scrubbed out. And it proves without question, we are not the same. I do want to talk about the ways we can better the representation of Hispanic and Latina people, especially in ways which haven't even been attempted, but it's worth pointing out the pitfalls current efforts for representation have made in recent years first. The concept of representing marginalized people through their suffering is a hot topic, but needs to be addressed before it solidifies as a good enough form of representation. If you don't know what I'm talking about, a great example of this, and I'm sorry if you enjoy it, as I know many people do, is Life is Strange 2, a story about two Mexican boys running from the police for a crime they didn't commit, trying to reach the US-Mexico border and make it to their father's hometown of Puerto Lobos. The twist, Sean's younger brother, Daniel, turns out to have telekinetic superpowers, and much of the game revolves around the player teaching Daniel about morality and tough decisions through Sean's actions. I'm going to be talking about spoilers, but I'm practically begging you to let yourself be spoiled on this, because it's an essential discussion and it's more important than finding out what happens for yourself. While the beginning of Life is Strange 2 is appropriately dark in order to set the boys off on their quest, the rest of the narrative quickly devolves into making two young Latina individuals excessively suffer beyond grounded limitations. A far-right, build-the-wall-touting old man chains Sean in his gas station back room, making racist remarks and calling Sean a spick. Their pet dog gets eaten by a cougar shortly after they acquire her. In their attempted escape from a marijuana farm they worked on under the table, which, by the way, making Mexicans illegally work on a field is also a racist stereotype. Very nice trims. Good work. Daniel loses control of his powers and destroys the owner's home, leading to Sean's eye getting impaled. Daniel, a nine-year-old, is shot. This constant escalation of suffering for the two boys not only replaces perfect space to introduce players to the Mexican culture the two boys are quite literally searching for, but also doesn't serve a purpose beyond wounding and traumatizing these characters for the milquetoast message Life is Strange 2 wants to impart. 
Racism is bad. The protagonists are put through harrowing ordeals in order to tie the audience closer to them, instead of doing so through love and understanding of who the boys are. Sean and Daniel aren't characters you come to know and care about through their passions or ambitions. They are ethnic pincushions we pity after watching horrible things happen to them. Furthermore, every positive advancement in the boys' quest to reach Puerto Lobos is in some form of white savior. A white blogger saves Sean and Daniel from being turned into the police early on. The blogger imparts Sean with the inspired wisdom of not everyone you're going to meet is a bad guy, puts them up in a hotel room for the night, leaves them words of encouragement and luck on their journey, and then magically disappears from the narrative. We then learn Sean and Daniel are half white, and their white grandparents shelter them for a time before the police learn of their whereabouts and help the boys escape. Later, their white mother saves them from the police yet again by surrendering herself, and even after that, a retired white security guard is the voice of reason, telling Sean to surrender himself to the police in order to lessen the sentences he would face. Despite Life is Strange 2 stressing how difficult it is to be Mexican in the United States, it seems as though it also wants to stress how nothing can be achieved without meeting some nice white heroes first. It can't be coincidence whiteness is viewed as strong or wise in Life is Strange 2, and that the boys' own whiteness is framed as more valuable than their Mexican ethnicity. Rather than meeting other strong Latina people who help them on their way to Mexico, good moments to showcase Latina people standing up for one another to overcome the challenges they face, their supportive interactions are almost exclusively with white people. As if, suddenly, Sean and Daniel are the only two Mexicans in the entire West West Coast of the United States. The game self-congratulates empathetic white people for feeling bad for minorities rather than creating a compelling argument for them to increase their level of social or political activism. It does horrible things to marginalized characters to satisfy its white creators' and white players' consciences. It could be argued Life is Strange 2 is making the point through the suffering. Whiteness is valued more in the US than other races or ethnicities, or marginalized people suffer greatly. However, it makes no effort to say anything beyond these obvious notions. It doesn't accurately portray that suffering, and rather than calling out prejudice for what it is, condones prejudice when it's convenient for its story. Sean losing an eye and their dog getting eaten by a cougar says nothing to me or anyone else about how we should be addressing racism. White savior solving the problem isn't helpful to Latine and Hispanic people looking for encouragement or support and says nothing about systemic issues. This is not empowerment or representation. It's pity and objectifying two Mexican boys in order to derive emotional attachment from your audience to your product. And this is why representation through symbolic marginalization isn't automatically supportive to those being marginalized. It's literally performative, using the issues people face as cheap emotional tugs and misery porn, and when it's convenient, relies on the same misrepresentation any other piece of media is guilty of to push feelings onto the audience. It makes others feel bad, but it doesn't help them understand. It doesn't make them care, and it doesn't make them appreciative of our existence. You learn nothing of Mexican culture in the United States from Life is Strange 2, but it wants to show you bad things happening to two Mexican kids. It enables the very same racism it claims to be smart enough to call out and address. And it's why we as Latina or Hispanic people need to demand better representation and more care when developers or the industry at large want to tell our stories. I don't claim to be an expert about creating good representation, and what constitutes good representation no doubt will change over time, but I am someone who is constantly misrepresented by the video games he plays, and I definitely am not alone in this regard. Instead of ending this on a high or low note, I'm going to leave you with some no-brainer tips on how to start the conversation better on how to represent Hispanics and Latine people better, because we deserve better. We deserve to be seen as people, not copy-paste villains or target practice for fatalist writing. Because you deserve better. You deserve to see more in your games. More variety, more accuracy, more authenticity, and more of everything which could improve your worldview and teach you something you didn't know in the process. Hire more Latine Hispanic people to write or work on your games. It's difficult to tell stories like Life is Strange 2 or create 
create worlds such as Guacamele without their input, experiences, and knowledge of how to correctly represent them. More importantly, and I cannot stress this enough, create and include more Afro-Latine and Afro-Hispanic characters and people in your games. Out of all the characters you thought of when we were playing our guessing game, how many of them were black? Yeah. Yeah, that's what I thought. Afro-Latine and Afro-Hispanic people are some of the most underrepresented in video games even when making up a significant part of the Latine and Hispanic population. Especially considering many Latine and Hispanic cultures were practically invented by Africans and people of African descent is this lack of representation even more alarming. Giving Afro-Latines and Afro-Hispanics a voice in the industry and allowing them to tell the stories they wish to tell not only adds representation to Latine and Hispanic people in general, but also finally provides visibility to a group who faces unique struggles within those cultures as well. They have so many stories to tell and ideas to create with and deserve to have the opportunity to share them. On that note, explore non-Spaniard, non-Mexican options when wanting to create a Latine and or Hispanic character. Mexico is not all of Latin America, and Spain is not the only other country with Hispanic ethnicities. Once you learn the differences between us, you'll see how beautiful those differences are, and better understand why those of us in North America come together in the way we do. Do the research. Take your time to learn a little bit of our histories and customs. Hire us to help you design those characters or write those stories. Hell, hire us so we can do it ourselves. Consult other cultures when considering representing Latine and Hispanic people as a whole. Consider including Hispanic and Latine characters who come from different countries and interact in unique ways otherwise not applicable to other characters. Stop using Latine and Hispanic women solely on the basis of sex appeal and characterizing them as temptresses or rude and nasty. Latina and Hispanic women are some of the strongest, smartest, and most capable people in our cultures. Every Latina or Hispanic person has a story about their mother or grandmother and how resilient and defiant they are in the face of adversity. These examples aren't outliers, and they aren't represented by Latina or Hispanic women characters in video games. To have a long history of strong women be reduced to dumb eye candy or irrationally angry TNA is awful, and it doesn't even begin to describe how Latina and Hispanic women interacting with these characters must feel. There's a couple of things you can do as a consumer of video games and video game related content too. It's as simple as playing video games made by Latina developers. To be fair, this is easier said than done as this kind of information isn't immediately apparent and often buried by storefronts and marketplaces. While I was editing this video together, for example, the Latinx Games Festival flew completely under my radar, despite being streamed and having a Steam sale event for a whole weekend. It's probably because Steam didn't make it one of its headline banners and relegated it to the 8th tab of the sales banner, which few people bothered to click through anymore. It's likely most people who use Steam had no idea the festival was even happening. The industry needs to be aware of the ways it hamstrings efforts made by marginalized creators to be seen, but if any of the games I've shown off and labeled just now seem like something you want to play, seek them out and give them a try. Talk about them if you like them, show them to your friends, and give validation to the developers you feel deserve it. Speaking of which, don't just listen to white, Hispanic, and Latina men. Listen to the women in gaming communities speaking out about representation. Listen to the Afro-Latinas and Afro-Hispanics in gaming communities speaking out about representation. Listen to them regardless of whether or not they're talking about representation. Make them seen. Make them known. Give them the support they deserve to have. Don't just listen to me, because it's not just me. And this isn't just about a small percentage of people. There are so many voices out there saying the same thing, saying it better than I can, saying something I haven't said, waiting for someone to listen. So listen. Now let's try this again. Hola, soy Giancarlo Vaque y tengo un problema con la representación de los latines en los videojuegos. Normalmente hablo inglés en mis videos, pero quería terminar este en español para ayudar a explicar mi punto. Quiero que pienses en cómo te sientes en este momento. Espero que esto esté creando una pequeña cantidad de incomodidad. Nada grande, pero al menos una sensación de algo familiar, pero extraño. Esto es lo que siento cuando interactúo con la representación latina en los videojuegos. En el mejor de los casos. <risa>